How are we doing out there? Everybody doing okay? A lot of good stuff today? Good. Get excited. Next we have a fireside chat with uh, Rachel Wolfson, Charlie Hoskin, and Frederick Grigard. This is going to be Input and Output and Cardano Foundation. So nice round of applause, guys. Let's welcome them to the stage. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us for this fireside chat right after lunch. I hope all of you are nice and full and ready to learn. Uh, my name is Rachel Wolfson. I'm the host and founder of Web3 Deep Dive Podcast. I'm also a journalist for Cointelegraph. And I'm doing a fireside chat with Charles and Fred. They need no introduction, but I'll briefly introduce them. So Fred is the CEO of Cardano Foundation. And Charles is the CEO of Input Output. Yeah, it's going to be a great fireside chat. So thanks again for joining us. The title of this chat is Unleashing the Power of Participatory Governance. Uh, before we get started with the questions, I'm just going to have the panelists briefly talk about themselves and what they do. Um, where they are. So Charles, would you like to just go first with a brief introduction? <laughs> Another brief introduction. <laughs> One thing in life I've never figured out is how to be brief. Um, so uh, I run Input Output. Uh, we do a lot of different things, but you guys probably know us from a little thing called Cardano. Uh, yeah, but we actually are a software company and a research company. I also am a venture capitalist. I, I created the C Fund, and I also have five other companies. So I do bison ranching, synthetic biology. We have a regenerative medicine clinic in Wyoming. Uh, a little bit of everything these days. I even have a construction company. So if you guys want to learn about geopolymer concrete, we can talk about that. Yeah, hi everybody. So uh, my name is Fred, and um, I don't have so much to say about what I do outside actually uh, running the Cardano Foundation. Um, what I can say maybe is sort of a little bit of an anecdotal story. So when I worked for PwC and sort of in the, one of the, the bull cycles, we had a few banks who were getting quite a lot of exposure to crypto assets. And I got the daunting task of walking into a room of auditors and explaining why blockchain matters. And sort of like halfway through this sort of presentation, I had like 150 auditors who was falling asleep and I needed to sort of figure out what to do. So I, I grabbed an apple from the first table, I threw it down to the French guy who was all the way in the back, and I said, so what's your exposure? Because an auditor, they actually sign, in, at least in Switzerland, you actually sign on the balance sheet. And I said, what's your exposure? And he looked at me and said, you know, dumb funny. He said, I, I don't have any exposure. And I said, well, the bank you're representing, they have a material exposure. Do you want to speak about what blockchain is and why this bank has a material exposure? And since then, you know, we built up the blockchain practice for PwC, and uh, I went away from the dark side uh, over to Cardano about three years ago, and the rest I think you know. Nice. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing. So, Fred, I'm going to start with you. Can you just explain? Oh. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Okay, I'm back on. Great. Can you explain the goal? Explain the goals behind the Cardano Foundation, um, just so we can better understand. Yeah, so the Cardano Foundation is a, is a non-profit Swiss foundation, and it's extremely different setup than other blockchain foundations. And that obviously creates sort of um, some frustration specifically from other ecosystems who's joining the Cardano ecosystem. But I think we're getting a little bit used to it, right? Because if you look at EUTXO and how Cardano is designed, it's always been designed with longevity and it's designed towards a much longer market fit than you know these you know, very fast moving blockchains. So what's special about it is that we do have personal liability. So the board and, and myself we have full personal liability um, and there is a supervisory authority who checks that uh, what the founders put into the deed is actually being lived 
Um, and if we stray away from that, that's when uh, yeah, we basically, uh, you know, unlimited fines and jail time and so on. We have three things we're trying to achieve. Um, and overarchingly, this is uh, education with a specific focus on regulators, policymakers, and where regulators and policymakers get that kind of information. Plus, when we anyway are doing it, uh, enabling you know ambassadors and others to get access to this content in an open source format, even other blockchains. So we're using it also for a bit for adoption. Adoption is the second pillar. So here we are really focusing on smoothening the journey on Cardano. So exploring the art of the possible. And uh, that means that we have a, a team of engineering and a team of uh, partnership managers who's looking at trying to explore what can be done on Cardano, which we haven't seen yet on a blockchain. And last but not least is operation resilience. As Cardano grows, it's incredibly important that we continue with the fantastic track record of you know, always being you know, up. But we also have to be very cognizant of the fact that a lot of new code will be introduced uh, in the years to come. And the difference between open source software and blockchain with open source software is that when you run open source software normally, you run an instant of that on your local environment. And if that goes down, you know what? It doesn't really matter. But if the decentralized network goes down, well, all of us are suffering. And there is no really good way to do disaster recovery management and so on. So therefore, you know, operation resilience is not only a fortitude of the Cardano design, thank you, Charles, but it's also one of the key priorities of, the, of, of, of what we do in the Cardano Foundation, because this is also some of the questions with both regulators, but auditors, and you, know, you are asking those questions also every day to, to us. How can we actually tell our clients, or how can we tell our local environment that this just keeps running smoothly with all these fantastic updates we are getting? Charles, can you explain the goals behind Input Output Global? So originally, Input Output Hong Kong, IOHK, was a project-oriented company, and then eventually we grew into Input Output. Um, and what we've become is a functionally a venture studio. And so we have, at the Topco, an incubation capacity to conceive of really amazing ideas and products. And then what we do is we create subsidiaries, we grow those subsidiaries, and eventually spin them out. So we have Midnight, which is a data protection privacy play. You have Prism, which many people have come to know and love, which is an identity play. We have Lace, which some people use here. It's a wallet. And then obviously we have infrastructure companies like Input Output Infrastructure, which is being incubated and spinning out, and that's what works on Cardano. So the advantage here is that what we can do as an organization is focus on what I like to call exponential technologies. So these are technologies where you put a little in and you get an exponential out. Uh, so many of the things that are going to guide the human race in the 21st century are of this class. Uh, quantum computing, synthetic biology, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, and blockchain. I think these are the big five. And what we try to do is build a portfolio in those dimensions and try to find some common threads between all of them. Blockchain was the first entry point because it's basically the governance layer of all of those types of things. Because these technologies are well distributed. A small group of people anywhere in the world can have exponential impact on your life. For example, in synthetic biology, five guys can get in a room, make a virus, it spreads, and then suddenly the whole world gets locked down as an example. Or if you look at nanotechnology, a small group of people could come up with something and then suddenly it could contaminate the entire environment. And then you have like the gray goo problem or graphene everywhere and you can't get rid of it and recycle it. So you need a regulating governance layer for this and a nation state is not well suited. It turns out blockchain is a great example of that. You actually need blockchain to do these things. And it turns out the governance systems of blockchain can actually be used for that. So what I really wanted was to have a corporation that focused on these types of portfolios and the wisdom behind them uh, and how to build these things and then empower and enable a whole network of CEOs and agile companies to go and execute and deliver and then watch that portfolio grow over a long period of time. The other thing we do is we're some of the best infrastructure builders in the world for cryptocurrencies, objectively speaking, and looking at the operational resilience of Cardano, the amount of papers we've written, our expertise in formal methods. And so we also build cryptocurrencies and we write high assurance software. And we're starting to institutionalize that to a point where those services can be more packaged and available uh, across the board. So we have about, I'd say 700 people, 800 people across the whole portfolio. And, 
employees all around the world, contractors all around the world, and it grew from two people 10 years ago, so it's been a pretty amazing journey. Great. So the fireside chat is about governance, so t let's talk a little bit about that topic. Um, I guess the first question is, what does participatory governance actually mean when it comes to Web3? And Charles or Fred, either of you can jump in. So in general, a governance system requires kind of three basic properties, and, and how much you put in each of those buckets is contingent on what are you governing over, and what is the risk of a governance failure. So the first, you need some form of consent from the users of the system. And this can be implicit or explicit. You can actually ask them to vote. They can sign an end user license agreement. There's delegated authority. There's direct authority. But you need some form of consent of the governed. Second, there's this issue of complexity where when you talk about governance, you have simple things to decide. You have complex things. So simple things are like, what color should we paint the bike shed? Complex things are like, well, how should we put control rods in this nuclear reactor and make sure it doesn't kill all of us? So what you typically do is the complexity ratchets up as you create bespoke institutions, whether it be the Cardano Foundation or Intersect or others, that they take a look at a highly complicated thing and they can handle that complexity and simplify it and summarize it and make it understandable for people. Final thing is you typically need to have some rules of the game which are hard to change. Sometimes those rules are regulated by natural law, like the laws of physics, for example. Sometimes those rules are theocratic, like uh, religious law. There's the theocratic governments like the Vatican or Iran. Other cases, those rules are constitutions, and those constitutions basically say things like freedom of speech or freedom of religion. And even if there's a, a majority desire to modify or change that, the system is self-constraining. So when you talk about any governance system, you have to kind of have some collection of these things. You have a day-to-day -day thing, you have bylaws or shareholder agreement or you have a constitution. And then obviously you have organs within your organization that kind of help you dissect all of that. Web3 is challenging because typically there's a fourth mode which is always silent, which is in the event that something happens, there's a fallback to a small group of people, whether it be a lender of last resort, a government, a CEO, who basically get near dictatorial powers to repair the system during its failure state. If you're truly decentralized, you cannot risk that capability. And so when Uniswap fails or Sunday Swap fails or whatever fails, like who's going to be there to clean up the mess if there's not a leader there? And this is kind of the thing that requires a little bit more thought. And what we've been exploring at Cardano, what Tezos explores and many other ecosystems, Polkadot, for example, with OpenGov, uh, to try to figure out a new way of solving that. Right. Fred, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, maybe a little bit about, you know, what does participation really mean, right? Because, you know, some of those decisions, as Charles mentioned, are, you know, very complicated, right? And, and sometimes you would say, oh, we need a voter participation over 50% or 60 or 70%. And sometimes, you know, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm so busy building, I'm so busy using, for instance, Cardano, that I don't necessarily follow all those sort of discussions around, you know, an edge case uh, parameter protocol change, and I don't really understand the game theory about what that actually does. So you tend to sort of overcorrect some of those things. So I think one of the really, really hard things which is, you know, ahead of us on this journey is a sort of also an, um, a combination of education, so that you need to have sort of institutions, and that could be the DREPs, who's going into the rabbit hole and doing sort of the game theory and, you know, really trying to understand that. And then you, if you don't sort of participate uh, directly with your own voice, that you then have the opportunity to have an, you know, a, a, you know, an unchained politician, if I'm misusing the word a little bit, right, who can represent you. And you have a sort of a punishment factor that if they're going astray, that you can actually pull that power back. And finding those right lines will require First and foremost, that there's not just one type of governance and one type of voting. There will be multiple types of governance and multiple types of voting. And the other part is that sometimes what we've observed in the last sort of, I don't know, 2,000 years of emerging democracy since the Greeks is that, you know, we have to be a little bit cognizant of that maybe sometimes, you know, um, a 10% participation, if it represents a good chunk of, of ADA holders, is, is sufficient. And other times, you actually need to have you know, a lot more than that. 
And I think we're just, you know, arriving sort of those discussions right now based on what happened in Edinburgh and Tokyo and, and Zouk. And uh, that's going to be a, a long learning curve around that because if we look at the world today, you know, it's very hard to point at a very good political system out there. So, you know, we have, you know, we know what we don't want to be. We know the direction we want to be, but there is uh, some work to be done there. Right. Um, Fred, could you also talk a little bit about Intersect? Is that a membership-based organization that the Cardano Foundation has launched, or correct me if I'm wrong? What is Intersect? So the, the whole idea about SIP1694 is that there should be the ability to have multiple membership-based organizations. But to get to that stage, you need to have something to learn from. So IOG actually launched uh, Intersect as a Wyoming um, uh, association. Uh, which is a very good jurisdiction. They, they changed a lot of laws in Wyoming and it's sort of, it's well known, which means that you, we don't have to sort of worry too much about the, the regulatory footprint. You always have to worry a bit, but it's known, it's sort of acceptable, they're front running, and they're doing a lot of really good things in that space. And that allows for the first time to think about signing over some of the assets which IOG has been maintaining for maybe a very long time and allow participation from not just the people in this room and the people around the world who is already building on Cardano, but also for the people who chose not to build on Cardano because it was very hard for them to get a seat at the table. You know, should I you know, go in and write a SIP? And you know, what's the process of, of the SIPs with Cardano compared to a BIP with Bitcoin and, and those things? Now, the positive note of it is that we already upgraded the SIP system to be you know, um, level with the best open source software in the world in terms of governance, right? So we are in a, in a good stage, people will feel familiar with it, but it does allow now people to, to have a seat at the table, at the right discussions in the technical steer course, but it also allows you a, a more sort of lenient way to say, you know, it's not just the pioneering entities who's deciding on a, on a form or anything like that, uh, but you can be a part of that journey. So it's really about sort of opening up and, and respecting that not just we as a community, but the general blockchain community has evolved a lot during the years. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. And it, it's the brainchild of a lot of conversations over the last three years. The foundation, for example, hired a, a very experienced open source uh, expert, and we had discussions with everybody from Apache to the Linux Foundation to the Hyperledger Group, and we learned a lot about how they ran an effective open source project, not just today, but historically, and also with different notions of membership. Um, Really, at the end of the day, there's three things you have to solve at core, at bedrock. If you don't solve them, you don't really have something. First, you have to really be good about who decides the product backlog. Regardless if you're building Starship and going to Mars, or you're building a, the next Pokemon card or something like that, no matter how complicated that is, you have some notion of a backlog and a collection of things that you do. Well, that backlog is always scored against the users, the customers, how the protocol is intended to be used. So you need some neutral place that a group of people can aggregate in and ha get some representation. And so the NFT community can come, the DeFi community, the SPO community, enterprises that are considering adopting Cardano, they say, well, we would love to do this, but we need this feature or functionality in order to make adoption relatively straightforward and, and easy. So that's one dimension and component of it. Second, there's going to be a lot more diversity in the clients of Cardano. They're already seeing the wallet space. We went from one to more than a dozen. So there needs to be a place where blueprints can live. Okay, so what is the official note of Cardano? There shouldn't really be a notion of that. Rather, there should be certified, non-certified. There's people in this room who are actually building a Go version of Ouroboros in the network stack. There are people who want to construct a Rust version of the client, a TypeScript version of the client. That's great because it creates operational resilience. If there's a flaw in one of the nodes, the other ones may not replicate that and protects the system. But how do we know that each node is adhering to a certain set of standards? You need some blueprints that are implementation agnostic. There needs to be a good custodian of not just the open source project and backlog, but also the blueprints of the system. And then finally, there's this concept of vision. Where do we go? Because some of the things we do are very tactical. We wake up every day and say, oh boy, we gotta fix that or improve the API or we need DB sync to not use so much memory or something like that. These are tactical examples of tasks for things to do. And there are other things you do which are very vision and strategic, which are high risk, high return. So for example, 
if we were to embrace a post-quantum future for Cardano, should we use lattice-based crypto or hash-based crypto? And in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, what does that mean for all the things? Or what is Cardano's roll-up strategy? Because there's about 27, 28 different approaches the last time I counted, you know, all across the board. They all have trade-offs and very unique technology behind them. That's not something any one party should have a monopoly of deciding. That's something that should come only after a very careful discussion of the consequences and trade-offs of each of these things, especially in Cardano's scalability horizon. With input endorsers, it really would change the incentive model, the stake pool model, and how blocks are made inside the system, the latency guarantees, perhaps even security thresholds, depending upon how that's put through. So by having a neutral members-based organization, what you effectively do is you create a place where everybody gets the ability to participate in a meritocratic way and express what they need, what they desire, and then that crucible eventually allows you to get to a point where a very complex thing gets simplified to yes or no thing. Uh, should we do this or not? And then you have a governance layer, 1694, if it gets in, and that governance layer basically can give consent. It can say, okay, we like the roadmap, we like the vision. Not only let's go do it, but here's the funding for it and let's get it done. And that's generally how most governments work. You have a legislative arm and an executive arm. The executive arm has a lot of the capacity to actually do stuff. And the legislative arm has the ultimate control of the purse strings and the ultimate control of consent. They give you the legal authority to do that thing. So we're trying to model it in that respect. But the other point, the final point, is the idea of competitive MBOs. Well, you need more than just development. You need marketing and adoption. You need regionalization. Like I often get asked, what is our Argentina strategy? Or what is our Vietnam strategy? Or what is our strategy for uh, Congo? Or what is our strategy for Japan? And you know, the thing is that I sitting in Wyoming probably are not the most qualified guy to tell you how we're gonna get strong adoption in Kampala. So what you need is you have to regionalize. And so once you have a really good members-based organization that's good at picking goals and executing goals with respect to development, architecture, and vision, it's very easy to create competitive groups that go and focus on adoption and growth in certain regions. Well, that can become a priority of Cardano, and the governing layer of the system can say, you know what, we're going to do a budget allocation. And these guys over in Argentina, they want X amount of dollars, you know, let's go give it to them and let's go see what they can do with that. But that's part of the deliberative process and the discussion process. And it's what makes governance so much fun and also so frustrating because you, have, you now have to bring the whole world along instead of a small group of people. Right, Fred, do you want to add anything before I go into my next question? No, I just think it's sort of really important because I spoke in my keynote a lot about adoption and the need for adoption for you know, economic sustainability of Cardano in the future. I mean. There currently is no sales organization or anything like that for Cardano. I mean, the purpose of the of IOG uh, is, is very different, as you heard, than from the Cardano Foundation. But none of us, uh, we are enabling people so they can build on top of Cardano. So we are more enablers than, than we are sort of specific sort of, sort of sales arm or anything like that. Because we, we really don't believe that that you can sit in, in Zurich or Wyoming and, and solve local problems with the narrative of what we grew up in and what we observe every day. So uh, my hope is that there's going to be a lot of organizations who's going to implement this as a part of their value proposition, whether that's an IBM or Accenture or Deloitte or whatever that is, and say, hey, here is a fantastic operation resilient third generation blockchain. And uh, you know, we're going to add that into our sort of you know, catering card or our playbook and start pushing that out in the local regions. And uh, you know, there's local players. There might even be people here in the community who's going to build a business around that. And they can then you know, be a part of Intersect and be a part of those things. But I think, you know, it's, it, what's, you know, that's, I think that's a really important point. This adoption cannot be underestimated. And also that it is not the responsibilities of the foundation nor of IOG to lead that worldwide. Yeah, so I have a question, it's kind of interesting. With Intersect, can you discuss a real world use case? Have, has there been a use case that you can kind of open up about and explain, you know, if somebody wanted to propose something and then there was a voting mechanism on it, can you, are you guys able to go into detail there about anything like that, just? I'll, I'll give an example. So currently we're uh, 
on the subcommittee and uh, working directly with the committee at the state of Wyoming for Wyoming stablecoin. Uh, so this is a really interesting one because the legislature passes a law and says the government shall endeavor to issue a stablecoin. <laughs> And they didn't really give a lot of clarity inside the law of exactly what that means. They just said, you guys go and do it. So now the state of Wyoming is trying to figure out, okay, not only how do we do that, but how do we do that in a way that's good for the citizens of Wyoming, doesn't create a war between the state of Wyoming and the federal government, and also uh, is something you could build an ecosystem around. Now, we'll, as a company, bid to build that, and we'll see through the RFP process if that makes sense for both sides. But let's say we do get that RFP in four or five years down the road. If you're a government entity, you have a political, moral, and in many cases statutory obligation to be involved in the governance of the platforms you use for the embitterment of your people. Uh, so they would be an example of a party that we would encourage to join Intersect. And then that state would say, hey, these are the kinds of features and functionality we would need to continue having a sovereign currency on the system. Or you could look for any uh, CBDC or state-issued asset-backed stablecoin or, or these types of things. Now, this is actually a tremendously complex project under the hood because it doesn't just involve the issuance of an asset or custodial standards. There's actually a rich discussion about how in a Web3 world do you automate regulation? How do you do KYC and AML? What markets should this be available for? Should it be B2B or B2C? And, you know, or is this just something that uh, other governments are going to start holding in reserve? What happens when this goes into the secondary market and there's market making and it ends up all in Africa and other places? Like, is that okay? Is that not okay? Who has redemption rights? These types of things. Each of those questions potentially leads to business requirements, technical requirements, infrastructure requirements that would need to be added to the roadmap of Cardano if Cardano was the, the platform for that to exist upon. That's a very practical thing because Wyoming could wake up and say, you know what, you can pay your taxes in this. Uh, when you get your tax refund from the state or if you know, you're, you're gonna get a welfare check or something, a, your cell phone app will just send you the digital money instead of that. So it really does behave like a digital dollar and that'll affect the lives of half a million people and potentially globalize the treasury of the state of Wyoming and put it on par with Circle and Tether. So it's a huge impact in the state. A second example that's probably a little bit uh, more practical is the sidechain ecosystem of Cardano. My view is going to be the, the largest and fastest area of growth because this is where we get to deviate a little bit from the design principles of the system and adopt competing, competing ideas. As much as I love extended UTXO, I, it's as news to me, but apparently a few people like the EVM. I, I just don't know why. And they've built infrastructure on it. There's a few, few good apps running in that world. So that's okay. And just like there's a difference between Java and C Sharp and JavaScript and Python, there are going to be reasonable differences of opinion about how people should build, maintain, and grow applications. So one of the things that's a high priority and is growing is this concept of building a sidechain kit and that sidechain kit basically allows people to extend the Cardano protocol and have a great degree of control over consensus, the ledger rules, the execution logic. So effectively, if they want to do EVM-based smart contracts, now they can. Well, that requires a lot of discussion and coordination, and that requires a lot of really deep, not only just technical, but a lot of business conversations about what that toolkit should have. So, for example, World Mobile is doing a really wonderful job building a functionally decentralized ISP. And there's actually people here right now connected to the World Mobile network on their own SIM cards here in America, you know, for decentralized ISP. It's a really crazy concept. They have a sidechain right now running on Cosmos infrastructure with a token on Cardano to bridge those two things together and get them off that and get them into the completely into the Cardano infrastructure. They're going to have a lot of very specific requirements that are telecommunication related, which may be at odds or in complementary to what we need for Midnight, a sidechain that we're constructing, which could be at odds if the state of Wyoming, for example, wants to do a stablecoin sidechain on Cardano because they need certain regulatory requirements or something like that. So who wins when you have three very amazing projects, a 
awesome privacy play that could have millions of users and be great for, uh, you know, Fortune 500, a telco that's growing at rapid speed, and an actual U.S. state that, that's doing things. Like, which one should get priority in the product backlog? The only way you can sort that out is you have to have a neutral members-based organization that can look at those things, try to find common cause, and then eventually make the decision through a, a, a deliberative process of how things should be prioritized in the roadmap accepting the consequences one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, the example that really jumps up to my mind right now is uh, in Intersect, there's now also the, what we call the, the Protocol Parameter Committee. And that's, that's a really tough job, really, right? Because when you think about it, I had a really good meeting with uh, Noom, which was revolutionizing music and really trying to, to do something about that here today. And they were saying, you know, we're really worried because, you know, if ADA goes up, what's happened with the uh, transaction fees? You know. You know, what's happening then? What's the process, right? And, and, the, and that's a really good question, right? Because in the past, we have protocol parameters which need a hard fork, and we have protocol parameters who don't need a hard fork. And you are sort of relying on a few experts there, right? But now that's already moved into to intersect into the protocol parameter committee, which means that you now have some people who are sitting and looking at, you know, not just the, you know, the technical feasibility, but also the economic and what that does to the ecosystem. Because you could, you could argue many ways, right? I mean, in, in a certain way, you know, if, if ADA goes up, that's very positive for a lot of other people, right? If, if you suddenly lower the transaction fee too much, what's happening? Should you find a complete different way of, of modeling it? So doing sort of, a, of an index or, a, 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 you know, a basket index of multiple currencies with inflation baked into it, right? So how complicated do you want to do it compared to what's actually technical feasible? So I think, you know, already now we, we're seeing sort of the first really good discussions in, in Intersect and, and some good pathways of, of moving that forward. But, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry to say that, right? But, you know, you really, you know, if, if you want to be a part of this, you should. But some of those things, there is no right or wrong answer. You will have to lean out of the window and you will have to do that on behalf of millions of people living on Cardano. And we cannot think short-sighted. We need to think about what that actually means, you know, all the way through. Because what we see is that when you, you, know, you, you optimize a little bit of the engine somewhere here, it might have a huge effect on alpha naught or something completely different which you didn't forecast at all. Because it is people, it's humans who's living on the blockchain. Right? So, yeah, it's, it's very, very interesting, but it's also challenging. Yeah, and I just want to add to right or wrong answers. This is the difference between trade-offs and research. So trade-offs for anything you want to do, there's going to be a state-of-the-art of the best possible combination of trade-offs for your use case, but it still may be suboptimal. Cancer is a great example of that. If you get cancer, usually you get chemotherapy. It may help, it may not help, but it sucks regardless. So you just have to pick the right treatment. And every now and then you get a new technology like oncoviruses or, you know, RNA vaccines or these things, and they potentially could cure it, in which case you actually have a much better outcome and you don't get sick like you did with chemo. So when you take a look at things like the transaction fees, right now there's a trade-off and it's related to the price of ADO. But then there's research like tiered pricing, for example, if implemented, it actually potentially gives you the ability to better regulate the fee structure without having to manually change things. You see, so the question is, how much do you put into basic R&D and how much do you put into execution of the existing things that you have? This is another one of the really hard decisions that ultimately has to be made. Uh, and it's not easy because sometimes you bet on the wrong technology. Sometimes you think you can do the good science and the science ends up being significantly harder than you intended. Like Ethereum is the greatest example in our industry of this where the people running Ethereum felt that proof of stake was a lot easier than it actually was. We bet right, we actually knew it was a lot harder, so we started from first principles and wrote GKL and Ouroboros Classic and Prowse and we received enormous criticism from the Ethereum community at that time, saying, oh, that's completely unnecessary, it's a bunch of math, nobody cares about this stuff. But what they didn't realize was their protocol was gonna work until it didn't. And when it didn't, they had to go back to the drawing board. They ended up spending eight years in an endless R&D cycle to deliver a custodial non-liquid staking system that is not exactly the best and they're trying to fix. Whereas, because we did the work and bet correctly, we actually were first to market with a provably secure proof of stake protocol and a much better liquid non-custodial uh, model. So we bet really well there. Did we bet well on extended UTXO? I think so, but who answers that question? Adoption. 
ultimately the market's going to decide, not today, but over a period of time, five years, 10 years, 15 years, of whether extended UTXO and channel isomorphism and these other things that you get, that ability to easily go on-chain and off-chain and link chains together is, is the dominant approach, or if there's a better way of doing things. So you need to have a neutral body that brings a lot of different people together and it creates your overall amount of collective intelligence and wisdom and it kind of helps you make that balanced decision of what technologies to bet on, how much research do you want to do, how much risk do you want to take, because if you, you do the risk and it works, you get a leapfrog over your competition, you get something better than what they have, and then how much do you want to do just short-term execute today. Um, and the best organizations like Apple and Google and others, they have a long track record of finding that balance just right. And it really tends to work. And unfortunately, there's a lot of examples where people are either too far ahead of their time or they weren't aggressive enough in their ambitions and then both sides get killed. Yeah. Um, a question that comes to my mind is just, I don't know how many members are a part of Intersect. And if you guys want to say that, feel free. But how can you ensure that everyone kind of has a seat at the table and gets their voice heard um, with the goals that they want to see achieved, I guess? Well, you can't. I mean, that's the whole thing, and that's the thing why we call it participatory governance in this fire chat, right? Because, uh, you know, somebody out there in the crowd or somebody, you know, building a Cardano will wake up one day and find out they had their head down in their project. They have had a fantastic product to market fit but they didn't have time or resources to participate in this. And then suddenly, you know, um, you know, a change or something will happen in Intersect, right? So, I mean, that's, that's sort of the thing, right? You, you, you can only create a process where it's possible to participate, which is a lot better than what we have in multiple systems and governments today. And then you can be open and transparent about it, and you can have different ways to ensure that the biases are not represented in the voting and stuff like that. But there is no way you can ensure that, you know, somebody's just, you know, was sleeping or, or were, you know, their priorities were somewhere else. Yeah, and you know, just to add to that, if you look at the history of things like the IETF and the W3C, we're, we're actually a member of the W3C. We sit there and we technically have the ability, if we chose to, to try to participate in the standardization of HTML and CSS. But I, I'm not delusional enough to believe... Uh, unless it's my MetaMask days, uh, that, uh, that we're going to be able to influence Microsoft, Google, Apple, and, uh, and Mozilla over how they should design their web browsers and what should go in them. So technically, while we're a member of a members-based organization, because our role in RIMMET and impact on the overall web experience for billions of people is so small, we don't have a very loud voice. But at least we're there, and we can kind of see how that process is going down the pipe. And it's very informative, and it kind of helps us understand what are the priorities, what are the maturities, and that alone gives us the ability to understand where the web is going. Well, MBOs and merit, meritocratic systems, they work this way. Uh, people who have very large and prominent products, a lot of scale, who put a lot of money, time, and engineering effort, they naturally have a louder voice uh, than people who don't. If you've designed an MBO in a right way, regardless of whether you have a, a, a faint voice or a very loud voice, you at least make sure that it's recorded. And you at least make sure that there's some consideration and that every now and then people can switch roles when the times demand it. So a great example is in all these standards bodies, whenever there's a, like a problem, like a security issue or something like the heart bleed bug with SSL, there's probably some weird guy in Nebraska that no one's ever talked to, and he happens to be the domain expert, and suddenly he's the most important person in the world because a third of the internet relies upon some conversation with him. Uh, so if you have a great organization, it's able to find those people and elevate them and give them the resources that they need. The other thing is that there is this idea of a servant culture where if you build on something, you have to improve that thing that you build on. It's not good enough just to take. You have to give. This is the ethos of open source. So if you're building on Cardano as a builder and you've received catalyst funds or funds from the treasury uh, when that opens up, well then you should have a mentality that at least some of the time, some of your developers should be contributing back to the open source project. And if you do that, you organically get on the committees, you're organically commenting on GitHub, you're doing a lot of things to basically promote that. That's how Linux works, and it's conquered the entire world. It's on your phone, it's in these microphones, it's in that TV, it's pretty much everywhere you look. 
Well, similarly, I think that's one of the goals that we ought to aspire for is that idea of, of mutual participation. And it's not easy in practice. It's its, its own discipline and field. P people have been doing it for almost 40 years now. Uh, there's many numerous examples of catastrophic failures. Those are forks. It doesn't just happen in the Cardano world or but blockchain world, it actually happens open source projects all the time. You have OpenOffice and LibreOffice and, you know, you have Postgres and MySQL and all this stuff and people fork and they change. Uh, and that's because of a governance failure, you know. And so if you're doing a good job, you tend to keep your community together. If you're doing a bad job, the objective external KPI is the community splits and fragments. As a historical footnote, when I was the CEO of Ethereum many years ago, before the earth cooled. Um, <laughs> many, many, in, the, in crypto land, it's ancient history. And, unless you're writing books, then it's current history. Um, but uh, no, I'm not bitter. Uh, so, <laughs> so back then they asked me uh, at a Texas conference, like what is the cryptocurrency you worry the most about? Does anybody know the one I was most scared of when I was there at Ethereum? Does anyone guess? It was, what was that? It didn't exist back then. This is how long ago, it was 2014. It was NXT. Because I saw these guys come out of fucking nowhere. They're on Java. They were the first on proof of stake. They had a crude native asset standard, which was pretty workable. They were working on smart contracts. It was called automated transactions. And if you look at their community growth, their metrics of, of development, how many different tribes of people that they got together, it was ridiculous fast. And I said, if this trend follows, these guys are gonna eat the entire smart contract space in six months, 12 months. Well, why did they fail? It was a governance failure. Uh, they broke into Crypti, into Lisk, into Scorex, into Wave, into all these different things because they had no mechanism of getting along. So while they grew very quickly, it was an unstable element and it fractured very quickly. And those fragments were not capable to have that emergent strength of a unified ecosystem. So there's a lesson there that it's, it's not just how fast you grow or what you have, but how do you keep all those different groups together and keep those groups happy over a long term? Good governance systems tend to keep their minorities and that tends to keep them feel like they, they have representation and they, they at least have a seat at the table, even if they're not always listened to, at least they know that somebody cared to listen and so they're willing to stay in the pool. Bad governance ecosystems, they grow very quickly, they fracture and fragment, fall apart, and then a year later, it's the pet rock. It disappears completely. Yeah, wow, that's, I mean, it's words of wisdom because if any project wants to survive, good governance is key. And I think that's something that we kind of overlook, actually, in the Web3 industry. Yeah. Um, we don't talk a lot about it, but my next question is, as Web3 evolves, how can we ensure good governance. I mean, everything is changing all the time. How can we ensure that governments, governance remains steady, I guess? Well, I, I think this has a lot to do with transparency. So when we designed the, the stake pool operators vote, we were very cognizant that we we're using um, a, a digital identifier or quasi a digital ID, which was basically associated with the stake pool, which made it, you know, visible what was the view of the stake pool. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of people is sort of, from some parts of the world, they're, they're, they're like, we need to be anonymous because, you know, otherwise people will come after us that we attack it on our back. But I think in general, the more transparent we are about how decisions are being made and the more better record keeping we do, the more liable we are also towards the outcome and the more we get motivated to, to really dig deep into it and ensure that we've done what we can to take the right decision. So I think transparency is, is definitely one of those things which is going to change um, how we vote and how much we care about voting. And that's going to change leaders, not just leaders of corporations, leaders of the blockchain space, but also leaders of nation states. And if you start changing that, well, look and behold, you'll get different decisions and you will get, you know, different, you know, entities who optimize towards different things and they have to be extremely transparent towards it. And I think the world has sort of forgotten that. And we're sort of, you're always looking towards the next, you know, yield or the next uh, monthly earnings or whatever that is. So. 
Yeah, you know, I always look at it like the difference between intelligence and wisdom. So, you know, there are many definitions you can use, but one that typically is used a lot in the AI world is this concept of intelligence being your ability to execute goals in an environment given resources. So, you know, if you're a mouse and you want to find the cheese, how easy are you to, is it for you to navigate the maze? And so more intelligent the mouse, the faster it can solve the maze and get the cheese. Wisdom is what goals do you pick? Uh, so good governance systems, they tend to have the ability to optimize both sides. They First, they have strong values at their core. That's what a constitution is about or rules are about because it, it says how do we treat and respect people. China is an example where it's a tremendously effective governing system if you have that value set. If you value Belt and Road and fast infrastructure construction and all the things that they do, um, then wow, look at how much progress they've made in 30 years. Well, if you value human rights and maybe you're not so happy with how they treat certain people, which many people are, myself included, then you say this is a horrific governance system because it excludes the rights of so many people and it, it, there's no notion of freedom of speech or expression or these types of things. So good governance systems, once you've set your values set, they tend to protect, promote, and enhance that and really have some prescience in their ability to find good goals to pursue and then recognize when the engine of goal pursuit, the intelligence of the system, is somehow compromised or not doing well. The United States is a great example where we failed on both sides. The governance system we constructed is incapable of accounting for the existence of political parties, special interest groups, and a gigantic federal bureaucracy. So ordinarily what you would do is say, oh, this governance system is not effective, we need to change it to account for these failure systems. But the problem is that the system is self-reinforcing because it benefits a small group of people. So at the federal level, you can never change it. It doesn't really matter who the president is or who the congressman is or these types of things. So there's a lot of wisdom you can gain by looking at where things have failed historically. So where have minorities been excluded? Um, where have good ideas failed? Like there's the most famous memo I have of all time was written in the 1990s at Microsoft when Bill Gates went to MSR and he said, hey guys, uh, I want you to look into the future. So the year 2000 to 2010, what are gonna be the three big things that are gonna dominate technology in that decade? Now these are the $600 billion company. They have a monopoly, the most powerful tech company at the time in the world. So they had the best people. So those people sat down and they thought really diligently and they said, okay, you ready for this bill? And he's like, yeah, mobile computing. So they basically wrote down the iPhone. It's like, okay, search. They basically wrote down the Google business model and social networks. They wrote down the Facebook business. So they, they had the play. They had the playbook for the iPhone, Google, and Facebook back in like 97, 98. And they had a monopoly, they owned everything, they controlled everything. So if they could execute, those three companies would not exist and Microsoft would run the whole thing. Why didn't they do it? Because the system was broken and it was designed in a way where it was impossible for them to execute the way that Facebook, Google, and Apple executed. So there's good governance systems are self-reflective and self-correcting and recursive in nature. They don't obsess with this idea of perfection, but rather what they do is they constantly ask the question, why are people failing? Where are people failing? How are people failing? And they say, how do we rebuild the system in a way to self-correct so we don't make that same mistake, or at least we make less of those types of mistakes? Bad governance systems tend to be very insular, isolated, and uh, basically fundamentalist. They just say, our beliefs are pure, everyone else is wrong. It's like, uh, you know, Principal Skinner, am I so out of touch? No, it's the children who are wrong. You know, it's, it's bad governance systems tend to do that and they tend to blame people and, and create that type of culture. If you want an example of like the best dr dr dramatization of a bad governance system, look at the Chernobyl miniseries in HBO. And so this horrible incident happens and the guys from the Kremlin arrive, the very first thing the bureaucrats on the ground are talking about or not, like how do we solve this horrific nuclear catastrophe which is worse than Hiroshima? It's, here's a list of people you can blame. It just shows you the mindset, the mentality that they have and it so perfectly epitomizes bad governance. Yeah, so Charles, you kind of gave me this thought as you were speaking about technology and how it evolves. So right now we're seeing a big boom around AI. 
Do both of you think AI is going to play a role in governance when it comes to Web3, and is it already playing a role today? Fred, <laughs> do you want to start? I think what we're seeing right now is amazing, specifically around the large language models, because it gives the average user the ability to, to use AI. However, it's so good right now that when you get the answers from the large language models, it's nearly impossible if you're not a subject matter expert to basically challenge that because the argumentation is there already. But it's not computational, right? So it's basically based on the, on the data set which is available and most of that is sort of a representation of the internet up to a certain year. And on the internet, the whole sort of business model is just flawed because it costs close to zero uh, to basically post wrong information. There is no consequence of doing that, right? So basically, if, if the large language model then basically says, you know, oh, there's more people who are saying this is right, then what computational actually is right is going to do a fantastic argumentation towards that this is right. So when you, you know, fast forward that into governance, right, what you're going to get is you're going to get a lot of people who's going to self-diagnostic themselves based on wrong information. You're going to get them to shortcut on political decisions based on whoever had the most Twitter bots out there spreading wrong information, etc. And I think there's going to be a really urgent, urgent need for embedding blockchain as a foundational layer on some of that, that what we're getting is much more controlled uh, data set which is verifiable and computable and that's why I'm sort of a big fan of, of Wolfram, Alpha and those things but I think it's going to actually on the short term I think we're going to see a negative consequence around AI in governance because we're all going to think we're the smartest in the whole world and we cannot we cannot verify the information we're seeing because it's so well presented. I love the AI question um, you know, I actually speaking of Stephen Wolfram, he keeps emailing me. We gotta, we gotta talk about AI. He just wrote a book on it, and I, the problem is, if you talk to him, it's like a five-hour conversation. So just clear the whole calendar. He's such a fascinating guy, and it's such a great organization. You know, Wolfram under the hood is a pack rat for some of the largest data stores that are computable in the entire world. Um, if you look at their back end, you can ask a question like, how many hurricanes have happened since 1950 in Florida that result in more than a million dollars of property damage, uh, you know, with uh, the following characteristics? And boom, it'll just give you a beautiful answer for it. It's a remarkable platform. But it brings up a broader question. is like AI, especially large language models, kind of live in this bizarre intersection of data governance, data availability, uh, and the, the, the concept of ownership. And we're having a tough time as a society grokking all of this because what happened is the people who are going to win that fight by default are not the innovators but the people who own all the information. So Google will not lose the data war in its current structure. It's impossible for them to lose except to perhaps Microsoft because both Microsoft and Google, they have so much information. Whatever the current best large language model is, they can always train it, tune it, and refine it better than anybody else. In fact, there's a project at Google right now called um, Google Gemini. And one of the founders of Google, Sergey Brin, came out of retirement just to run it, where they're literally spending billions of dollars training a model that is much larger than GPT-4, and they're training it with representations from all of YouTube, all of Gmail, you know, the Google Docs and the other selective data sets. And they're doing, instead of RLHF, reinforcement learning, human feedback, they're doing RLAF, reinforcement learning with automated feedback, where they're actually using other large language models to assist in the tuning and training of the system. Well, you've taken a super slow, expensive human process and replaced it with an automated process, which then can be cycled back through to reform it again. So that's where you get that exponential growth. And Gemini is not hypothetical. It's going to be in market to replace BARD next year. So there's exponential growth in these large language models. And this is actually an exponential technology. And it's an area where I think that blockchain could have a huge impact in. Uh, I believe we could actually solve the ownership, governance, and availability problems and create incentives for a decentralized LLM to be constructed and regulated and constrained with much better rules. But you'll notice something is that every field actually has some code word for governance. So in the case of AI, it's alignment. 
That's the thing they say. We got to have alignment. I was at an AI conference recently in Vegas, and the Air Force was there, the chief data officer of the Air Force, and gave this lovely presentation. And we got a 40 page document of the US Air Force's AI policy. And like half of the docket was just about the ethics and alignment of AI. Okay, so this is a 600,000 person organization that literally makes life and death decisions on a daily basis. Uh, and they're automating a lot of things and ethics and alignment is like their biggest concern in that process. They have no real meaningful good solution for alignment. No one does at the moment. And a lot of people say alignment's harder than AGI. Well, it turns out that if we can solve decentralized governance and blockchain, my view is that's, that's not, it's either ISO or homomorphic to, to basically the alignment problem. So actually I think that the only way to beat the Googles and the Microsofts in the default state in, in building these AI systems is to actually build a blockchain based system. Now, I think Cardano could actually be one of the biggest players in this space. Talk about long term practical use cases. Why? Because we have midnight for data privacy and protection. And also, we just came out with a paper out of Tokyo Tech where we developed a proof of useful work where the proof of useful work is aligned to training in LLM. So you could actually use a distributed computer to basically do what Google is doing in the Googleplex and all these big NVIDIA clusters are doing, and you can incentivize it. So I think that a lot of the roots and guts are there, and if we solve governance in Cardano, you could also use it as a governance layer for how people are to responsibly use a large language model. Because they're here to stay, they're not gonna go away, there's too much competition, their capabilities are growing, they're resolving problems like hallucination, prompt engineering is like the new engineering field that people are going into, and those capabilities will continue to grow and they'll be continue to get much more pervasive. They currently still lack wisdom, but one final point on this is that this is really the first technology in the world that's very different than all other technology. Every technology used to be an augmentation of us. So if you write something down, you create a printing press, you can mass manufacture that and now distribute your thoughts to thousands to millions of people. If you're a farmer, you can build farming equipment to help you plow the field, but ultimately you're still making the decision of where the seeds go and what to do and what to grow. This is the first technology where it's displacing us from a creative aspect. It's coming up with all these great ideas and these things, and they're becoming black boxes to us. We have no idea how they work or why they work. Look at social credit in China. So they're gonna do a CBDC and combine it with social credit, and then suddenly people's money is gonna be turned on and off. You'll go to the local government official and say, why was my wallet frozen? And they're like, your score is too low. They say, well, why? They say, I don't know, the computer told me. You know, because the model is giant, it's huge. And unfortunately, what if all the technology around us and all the inventions around us live the same way? It's like alien technology. You find it, you can use it, but God knows how it works. And you have nobody around who can maintain it or do it. So that's the other side of the, of the problem is how, how do you not lose the human component of understandability of these things? Um, and that, that is a little bit beyond blockchain. But it's a great field and it's a phenomenal topic. I wish we had like an hour to talk about it because there's, there's so many cool things to do. But I do believe Cardano can play a huge role in the future. They're at least on the governance and alignment side and potentially in distributed computing side of it. Yeah, um, I mean, there are so many questions I can ask both of you. I know we only have a few minutes left, but I wanna ask this question, Charles. Um, you bring up so many good points and great use cases for blockchain technology. Do you think the regulatory environment in the United States right now is hampering adoption? To bear shit in the woods. Uh, <laughs> you got a bunch of people that were born when World War II was going on, uh, who are still in charge for some reason, who don't even know how to use a computer, who have the audacity to tell us how these protocols work and what they should do. It's not only offensive, it's, it's damaging to the entire integrity of the US system. The reason we're so powerful, the United States, is because we got ahead of a lot of technologies. We were first in the oil and gas business, first in the aerospace business, first to do mass manufacturing. You know, we were the first to do the internet. We did Bell Labs. We invented all these amazing things, fiber optic and the C programming language and Unix. We were the first ones to do the computing industry. You know, we, we just were able to do this. Why? Because it wasn't that we were all geniuses. We just found a way to get all the geniuses to come here. Almost all these businesses were started by immigrants. All these scientists came from somewhere else. The Manhattan Project, the Germans should have beat us three years to it. 
But Hitler kicked out all the good scientists and they came to the United States and we had Enrico Fermi and all these Europeans and they worked and we were able to get the bomb. What they've done in just the last few years is they put up a sign, Gary and the rest of the gang, that says, you're not welcome here, go somewhere else. And that doesn't just mean we lose uh, a few good businesses. It means you lose an entire generation of minds that are thinking about decentralized technologies and how to apply them in every aspect of our lives. It also means you're losing some of the most brilliant cryptographers, information security experts. It's so fucked up in an age of cyber war where we're saying the big war with China will be a cyber war. You're literally creating an incentive for the people who are best able to fight that to leave the nation. So it's hurting our ability to grow, it's hurting our competitiveness, it's destroying the entrepreneurial spirit of the United States, and it's affecting our national security at its core. And furthermore, it's creating this culture of pervasive crony capitalism, where SBF gets to be the face of the industry for a while until it's a Ponzi scheme, and then even so, he's somehow probably gonna squirrel his way and get some charges dropped because he gave the right people money. What are you telling the rest of the world? The integrity of the US markets and that concept of rule of law is now gone. You need to go somewhere else uh, because you're not going to get it. You're not gonna be treated fairly. It's just however your politics are and whoever you've bribed and you have a relationship with. It's disgusting, it's despicable, and it's, it's just sad. It's absolutely sad and uh, it's not gonna hurt crypto Honey Badger don't care. Crypto is going to keep moving on. The world's going to keep moving on. It's going to hurt the United States. It's going to hurt our next generation of people. It's going to hurt our ability to pay back the $31 trillion of debt and the debased U.S. dollar we have. And ultimately, it's just going to make us a less prosperous nation and continue in the decline of things. But, you know, that's what empires do. They shoot themselves in the foot and, uh, and for political reasons, and then they pretend like they've done something good for you. On a positive note, here we are. <laughs> and we're based, oh, I'm based, and Charles, I think you're based in the US, Fred, I don't know about you, but. I'm based in Switzerland. Okay, Switzerland. <laughs> good for you. Which is doing a very good job, all things considered. <laughs> okay, so I, I do think we're out of time. So thank you again, Charles and Fred, and thanks everyone for joining us. This was a really great chat. Thanks. <laughs>